very much for coming. Also, Vanos, thank you very much for joining us once again. It's always a pleasure to see you. And uh, with any other further ado from my side, I would like to call uh, Professor Marius Di Diagos, director of c 4 for his work on the Thank you, Vendela. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a great uh, honor to have uh, today with us two distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, first uh, is Ella Moore, uh, uh, who comes from the uh, Oregon College of Engineering. So Ella has holds a courses and teaches innovation through the organization. She founded the uh, IDE experience. She has uh, 13 incredible years of uh, expertise at renowned innovation and design firms, uh, in particular to, in IDO. Her design practice and leadership at IDO spanned uh, diverse uh, geographies, industries, and sectors, with clients from uh, startups to Fortune 100 companies. She was founder of IDO's leadership studio for developing project leaders, as well as for the design research practice in IDO's Shanghai studio. Ella has taught at pioneering Olin College, profiled in the book Creating Innovators since 2007, and offered workshops through MIT, her alma mater, Sloan, Babson, Dartmouth, Harvard, and the International Development Design Summit. Ella enjoys adventure in the great outdoors and improvising on violin. Her two and four year old daughters are her inspiration. So our second speaker is uh, uh, a close friend of uh, the Center for Entrepreneurship, uh, Panos Panayi. Uh, for those who don't know Panos, he is the founding di managing director of Berkeley Eyes, the Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship at the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. And uh, he's also a passionate entrepreneur and active startup mentor in the creative media space. So Panos founded Sonic Beats, and uh, through uh, this uh, firm, he created the leading platform for bands to book gigs and market themselves on online. And for building, uh, he, he managed to build a subscriber network of uh, over 500,000 bands and 35,000 promoters from over 100 countries. He led the company as CEO for 13 years. Uh, and he is widely credited for spotting and capitalizing early on three distinct emerging trends in the music business uh, over the last decade, the shift to a, primary, a primarily online means of marketing, the emergence of a, an artistic middle class, and the shift from a record label funded industry to a consumer brand funded music business. He writes weekly about startups and the entrepreneurship for blogs, publications such as Huffington Post, Forbes, uh, Wall Street Journal Accelerators, and Fast Company, and so on. And he has been a speaker and guest lecturer in many prestigious institutions, including the University of Cyprus. Yeah, of <laughs> uh, so uh, thanks again for coming. I mean, Panos and Ella, Ella and Panos uh, did a, took a very long trip. So they are very tired, but uh, I mean, they are going to inspire us, I'm sure about this. And by closing, I would like to, to thank our uh, co-organizing uh, organization this afternoon, uh, the Interaction Design Foundation, Cyprus. Uh, Interaction Design Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that promotes interaction design, user experience, and HCI. So the floor is yours. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. And I'm sure this is going to be a very good experience and uh, for our community in the university as well as uh, the community at large here, the South Africa community. So thanks. Uh, Yasas, I'll speak in English so I guess Ella can understand. <laughs> um, I'm honored to be here. I think it's the third time that I've done this in the last few months. It's part of a um, a, a personal uh, sort of resolution to help uh, bring as many amazing minds from the U.S. To, to Cyprus. I'm very passionate about the country that I grew up in, all the gifts that this country and, and my, fam my family in particular has given me. Um, I, uh, a few years ago, I got a really good piece of advice from someone. Um, he said to me, if, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're getting really bad advice. Um, and admittedly, when I was younger, uh, I think I was always focused on being the most interesting and the smartest person in the room. 
And as I've grown older, I realized that um, it's far more interesting to actually um, connect with a lot of really smart, really cool people and ask an interesting question and just have them go at it. Um, and part of my job at, uh, at Berkeley, um, where I started the Institute for Creative Entrepreneurship, and this series is part of a partnership that we started with, with the university to, to bring these amazing people here. Um, but I started realizing that one of my jobs was to go out there and curate or handpick great people and bring them to our students. And uh, the objective, of course, is to foster a particular mindset. Uh, it's, for me, less so about specific or very direct um, you know, action or skill development all the time, but it's also about fostering a mindset. You need conditions for things to happen. Um, so as part of that uh, fact-finding mission or cool people-finding mission, um, I, we had Eitan uh, Shapiro, for those of you who were here a, a couple of months ago, and now um, another one of these super cool, amazing people is Ella Benor. Uh, and it's, it's just a coincidence, actually, that the first two speakers we've had are both from, from the region, and in particular, Israel. Well, coincidence in the sense that it's the first two, but of course not a coincidence in the sense that it's not a secret that our neighbor has some amazing minds. Um, so I'm very excited about uh, Ella's presentation. Uh, she will be the, the, the primary uh, rock star for, for the evening. I may join for a short conversation afterwards, uh, but we're looking forward to, uh, to this afternoon. And thank you all so much for braving the uh, Cypress heat in June to uh, come to this. Really appreciate it. Ella. Thank you, Panos. Sound good? Yeah? yeah? OK, great. Um, just a quick show of hands. Who has at least one thing that they wrote? Anything? Some people did this? OK. Um, I invite you, if you haven't already, to write something that's on your mind, your landscape of challenges that are on your mind, whether they're small little speed bumps or big mountains you're trying to climb, whether they're technical personal, interpersonal, kind of team or family scale, organizational community scale, or, or global scale, whatever is on your mind. Um, we'll use that a little bit now, and if you're staying for the workshop, we'll use that a lot more. But first, hi, I'm Ella, and um, I, from the first person I met from Greece, I knew that that meant to come here, and so it's a nice coincidence because a bunch of you are way back there. I'm going to say one more time, Ella. <laughs> I went for a run when I first got here. I had to go for a run, and I, I heard my name an awful lot everywhere I went. Um, so, so hi, I'm Ella. Thank you for, for spending some time with me this afternoon. And I'm kind of obsessed with kind of the space and, uh, and how to enable sort of people to feel even more empowered in, in any kind of challenge, big or small of any kind. And uh, that has been a journey that has taken me to something called the Innovator's Compass, which was the title of this talk. And we're going to get there. I'm going to tell a little bit of that journey in this talk. For the talk, I'm focusing on um, sharing stories and examples, and in the workshop that's later for people who are staying for that, to get in and start doing it, to be completely honest. my my usual mode is to just do, and it's been really great being asked to, to actually talk a little bit more before we jump in. So I'd like to start here with you talking. What are some of the things you associate, just words, single words you associate with being an innovator? Brave. Brave. Risk-taking. Risk -taking. Thinking outside the box. Thinking outside the box. Outside the box. Creativity, passion, inspiration. Anyone else? Steve Jobs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The personification of, of innovator. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Creativity. Creativity. Yeah. Again. Well. I've been really lucky to spend about 20 years in the world of innovation and in, as an innovator and, uh, and growing innovators. Um, but the journey started here, not 
not here, but um, while I was born in Israel, my, my family moved when I was three months old. And uh, where I grew up, like this was about five minutes away. So scenes like this were about five minutes away. Not the most innovative landscape you might imagine. But I left there at the, in 1993 um, to go here, which is MIT. Have people heard of MIT College? Just check. Um, and working on stuff like this. So this is a force feedback simulator for laparoscopic surgery, so pinhole surgery where they don't open you up but little small holes. Um, so that was my master's thesis. I was very interested in, in designing things that are being used by people, designing for people. But the whole time, I was also really interested in design by people. And so these are a couple of pictures from my side project, which was working on uh, the first robotics team with high school students in the area because I was really excited by what people doing design, um, how they developed, how it helped them sort of learn principles of physics or even principles of, about themselves um, by doing. Then I went here in 1997 and then in 99. Um, this is a company called IDEO. Have people heard of IDEO? Anyone heard of this company? A few people. Okay. So IDEO um, has gotten some popularity, some, some um, exposure, especially in the US as of late, um, for what the power of design can do, design in a really broad sense. There's IDEO on Fast Company's list, and many of the other companies there are, are ones that were clients of IDEO. It's a design and innovation consultancy that helps other firms be creative, be, be innovative, and develop innovative offerings. And that notoriety came, it started with doing things like the first commercialized Apple Mouse. Tangible things, you know. They make a sound. You know, most of the things that we worked on when I joined were things that were tangible, like this. But it grew tremendously, and to things like this top one is actually one of my projects we're going to talk more about today, um, but the interior of a jet, the smallest, um, least expensive jet that's ever been developed. And broader things, like this is a picture from a project about how to get people to donate more blood. This is a picture from a project about how to get clean water across developing areas, um, how to get young people to eat better how to get people to save more money. So much increasingly broad, broad kinds of problems being solved with the same kind of design approach that we'll talk more about. Not too long after I started at IDEO, this college started um, outside, outside Boston. Has anyone heard of Olin? Some people have. Um, it's considered one of the more kind of pioneering schools in the, in the US. And it has sort of at its, one of its cornerstones, you know, it's an engineering school, so superb engineering. Entrepreneurship is one of its, the sides of its triangle, as well as arts, humanities, and the social sciences. And really a heart around creativity, innovation, doing. Learning by doing. It's a very project-based school. That's a picture from one of my classrooms of people doing the same kind of stuff that we were doing at IDEO. And for that, it's been profiled in the book Creating Innovators by Tony Wagner. So towards the time, end of my 13 years at IDEO, I had my first daughter, Maya, on the right. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's, I, I think that there's a double meaning to necessity as the mother of invention, like it goes the other way. <laughs> Mothers have to be really inventive, and I found myself making all kinds of things to solve all the problems of, and challenges of, of, of motherhood, but also really prioritizing and finding a focus on, um, really focusing on helping people be creative and helping people do what we do at places like IDEO. And so I left IDEO to kind of go out into the world and see how I could help with whatever people were working on. And you know, I was very fortunate many people came to me um, in all kinds of .org, .edu, .com kinds of organizations. Um, and usually to have me help them with kind of the upper right big projects, but it ends up being about all these other things. And so my work now has been very much about working very hands-on with individuals and organizations 
on their problems to help them be innovative. Through my own company, I didn't say this, which is eye to eye experience. Eye to eye, uh, being seeing eye to eye, being human centered in everything we do, also going from innovator, I'm sorry, from individual to innovator. So I have some observations from all of these uh, innovation landscapes I've had the honor to be a part of. This is the first one. All of our big goals mean navigating lots of different little challenges every day, right? You've seen this continuum a few times now, right? From bumps to mountains and from individual to global. This is innovation students. These are the students at, at Olin. And it's a little hard to read these, but things like mechanical problem sets, um, uh, coding challenges that they're having. Um, those are really hard to read. These are, am I spending my time wisely? Um, am I doing too much? Relaxing and finding it hard to focus. I can't read that one anymore. Oh, dealing with um, uh, imposter syndrome, a feeling of imposter syndrome, if anyone's heard that. Do I, am I really good enough to be at the school, to be an engineer? Long distance relationships, very important when you're a young person. Um, thinking about their impact wider, how do I help empower other people in STEM, science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics, like young people, children? Um, and then broadly, how, how do I have enough impact? What's my duty? to myself and to the world, and to, the world, to others. These are all things that are on students' mind in one of my classes, right? the whole range. In order to do these big things, um, oh, and the last one over there is, is, do I do industry or do I do um, grad school next year? Right? All these kinds of things. All these things are on people's minds at once. This is a group of uh, entrepreneurs, specifically entrepreneurs in the education space, so education product services, offerings, new schools, and they're thinking about similar things, like what's my next move? What should my next role be? Learning to say no. Um, dealing with capacity and time management. I can't remember what this one is. Oh, how to alleviate family concerns, right? These are all entrepreneurs. They're working really long hours. Um, building and and creating my dream team, and a diverse team is what it says, I'm sorry. <clears throat> how to get validation for my new venture, how to raise money. Um, oh, balancing sponsorship with, with agility and being independent. All these things that are on people's minds. So I just shared a lot of things that are on people's minds. I don't know how many of this, these sticky notes look anything like the sticky notes that you had. Are there some in common? Yeah. And what I would say is, you know, for any organization, big or small, it's just the people in it. So all these things that are on people's mind, in order for them to do the big things, they have to be able to navigate all those small things. And when you are the organization, that is even more true, right? <laughs> oh, and this final one up here, vision. What is my vision? How do I create value? So our big goals mean navigating lots of different little challenges every day. I'm not the only one who said something like this. This young man on the left, um, when he was six, he decided that people should have clean water. And by the time he was 17, his foundation and his organization had placed 1,000 wells in Africa and gotten clean water to 800,000 people. Um, and so that's pretty cool. And he said, there aren't really big challenges, only lots of little ones. Second observation. There are great processes and mindsets out there for finding new possibilities in all of these different spaces. But they can be a little hard to access. So in all of these different realms, these are a bunch of different processes that I've had um, the opportunity to learn a little something about or that you might be familiar with. Do at least one of these look familiar, two or three or four? I'm going to talk to the one, about the one that I know the most about, design thinking, which is, um, oh, oh, that's in the wrong place. Um, <clears throat> well, who's heard of design thinking? We talked about IDEO, a couple of people. It's a term that kind of came out of IDEO um, and Stanford 
and is been written about extensively by IDEO, by Stanford, by others. It's basically the way that, you know, people like at IDEO designed all those things from the mouse to how to get clean water across, across developing areas. How do they go about that? Um, not just designing, but how do we think as designers? These are all resources that are out there. I'm going to just tell one story. It's actually a pretty early story. I think this is about 2002, a project that I was a part of that you saw in that magazine earlier for a company that was then called Eclipse Aviation. It was a startup. It was an aviation startup. And their goal was to create the smallest, um, cheapest jet that had ever been created. So all of what kind of you think about with a jet in a million dollar package. They didn't quite hit that, but they tried to come really close. And so you can imagine this thing has a lot of really tight constraints. It has a weight budget, a space budget, an elect a power budget, and of course, a cost budget. So there's a lot of competing constraints and, and stakeholders who are fighting tooth and nail for a little bit of space here and a little bit of money there. This was our team, myself, Kate Schreiber, um, designers, Bill and Florian and Michael, our team leader, and uh, you can tell we're hands-on. We're in Albuquerque on the, on the tarmac. We spent a bunch of time working really directly with the startup. And this is our design thinking journey. So it began, began with really looking, listening, getting in there, spending time with pilots in planes. Um, this is a, a pilot that we're talking to, a private pilot with his own plane. And um, looking at what he does, really listening, um, finding everyone he could, the pilots, um, maintenance people, um, the people within the company that would be selling it, um, the people who maintain the plane, oh wait, with a lot of these, that's also the pilot, like this guy also has to take the, the commode, the, the potty out of the top, the, the pilot and get it, out of, I'm sorry, out of the plane and get it cleaned. So just sort of understanding all of their experiences and really empathizing with them. Um, as a big part is sort of the first piece, right? Just observing what is happening now, trying to pay attention to the details. And not just looking, not just listening, but even physically getting into this. And so I think that might be one of the last times I've ever worn a suit, but trying to, you know, getting a flight on a small plane, this was a propeller plane, but still, what's it like to be on a small plane in a business suit or with a baby stroller or with a wind sail? What is it like to open a a bottle of nail polish in a tiny little plane. Well, when you're designing the lavatory where you go to the bathroom, it became really helpful to know that oh, we know firsthand smell travels really quickly. So, you know, you're getting into this with all your senses and you're really observing what's going on. And looking for inspiration from the past, from the future, futuristic architecture, um, from aviation, from outside aviation. And then making sense of all this stuff. So this is an example around lighting. So for every part of the plane we were working on, for lighting, in this case, thinking about every sort of stage of the journey and what are the design principles, what's really important at every stage. Don't know yet how we're going to get there, but what's really, what matters most to the experience? And I'm not going to go into details about these. But then with those principles to guide us, generating as many ideas as we can about how that could work, what that could look like. Um, this, some of these things, like these, this lighting may not seem that unusual. It's very unusual for a small plane um, to try to think about this sort of space lighting and, and then thinking about a plane almost more like a car, like a luxury car, like how does it greet you when you come to it on the tarmac? Um, what could that experience be like? And then making stuff, prototyping. You can tell this is a while ago. I don't look like that anymore. But, um, you know, being really resourceful. What is the fastest way to start trying these ideas out? I got samples from lighting companies. They'll send you free samples very quickly. And so I had to string together samples from different companies to try to make this, you know, prototype light. Um, and we tried it out and, and played with it and messed with it until we got it to work. Very, very cheap, very, very quick prototyping. Um, and then, you know, in this, this model, which was basically a big piece of foam, um, not a real plane at all. Um, this is the CEO of the startup that is there, and, and everyone else from the, the company is coming in and getting to experience it very early on. Everything is made of foam and paper and, and scrap samples, but they're getting a feel for the experience, and we could change it very quickly. 
And here's the final plane. The pilot, the first, first one that was made. Same thing for everything, every challenge. So this is the, the cockpit. This is kind of important stuff. What goes where in the cockpit? Similarly, asking really provocative questions. The way things were organized had nothing to do with human experience right now. It was a lot about, well, this is where the wiring goes, so that's why we have to put this here. Um, but asking really provocative questions about things like, hmm, in an emergency, why are the three things I need in this emergency here, here, and there? Um, and, and then playing with it again. You know, it's a lot easier to sit down with a pilot and move these controls around on sticky notes than to start moving wiring around um, and playing in three dimensions as well, but all in paper and in cardboard. And then the final. So that's, that's design thinking, the way it works to solve a design problem. Going great, right? Great design, things are going well. But, you know, at the same time, um, there's a lot of challenges that we're actually making it difficult to do great work. Here's our team. In this team, there's some, there's some interpersonal challenges. I mean, you never have these, right? Your teams never have problems between people, some personal challenges people are having, some conflicts between our team and the client sometimes, um, some pressure under deadlines and how to handle those. All these things are happening. And, you know, all the things I talked about, um, empathy and experimentation and iteration and being really human-centered, there were times when I'm wondering, like, I don't, I don't think we're applying that right now in this team problem. Somehow it's not feeling very open and experimental about how we deal with this or very empathic. And so I notice this is kind of a trend, you know, amazing work happening and, and generally, we, I mean, we've all been doing this for a while. We have great experimental mindsets, but under pressure and in different situations that aren't obvious design situations, somehow those mindsets are a little slippery. They somehow don't quite seem to, to come into play. And I was kind of wondering about that and after, you know, more and more years of being at IDEO, not just doing projects, but then leading projects, coaching projects. I increasingly was kind of curious about what's the most powerful yet simple way we can hold all these things we know about being empathic, observing, coming up with powerful principles, being really creative with ideas, being really experimental in a way that we'll use it not just you know, at the meta level, um, at the big level, but all the time, and we never lose it. You know, how can we, we hold that with us all the time, even when we're maybe not thinking as clearly as we maybe could be? So I started playing with some ideas and experiments at IDEO and, and afterwards, after I left, and you know, as I'm trying to share design thinking, uh, evolving the way I do it. So I, I left much like with the same, very similar slide deck to what I would have used at IDEO to teach design thinking. Lots of slides, lots of words, trying to teach design thinking this way. Came up with what was actually the shortest, most compact design thinking sort of worksheets or workbook at the time. Two, I had sort of five, four stages, two worksheets a piece. Shortest thing out there, felt pretty good to me. Hurdled this a lot, I'm so inspired. Yay, I'm really happy to hear that. But I'm noticing this. Maybe you're feeling it right now, I don't know. <laughs> but I can tell people are like, oh my god, it's another slide. Um, or the look, I'll never forget the first time I gave those worksheets to a group of high school students, like inner city high school students, and this girl is holding them up and she goes, she drops it on the table and she gives me the look, you expect me to do this? I'm not doing this, what is this? She didn't say that, but her eyes did. What are we doing? Like in the nicest way, right? But somebody is a little bit lost. Every time I hear that, I'm like, oh, fail, right? Like, if you don't understand what we're doing right now, it's not your failure, it's mine, right? You need to, first of all, really understand what we're doing and why, and then we can get into the details. But people feeling lost means they don't own it, and they're not going to own it anytime soon. How does this apply to me? You know, a lot of those design thinking workshops we were doing, you were designing something, like we would design you know, some kind of um, throwaway project, like design a wallet for your partner. Okay, fine, but I'm a teacher. How, how does this apply to my everyday work, right? I hear that all the time. 
this isn't how I'm creative. This process you're teaching me, like this does not resonate with my own creative process. I don't know, it's not working for me. Or it's too conceptual. There's too much lingo or buzzwords. Can you be concrete? The word concrete, I hear it all the time. Be concrete. Um, this takes too much time. How am I gonna fit into my life, my teaching, my crazy business life, you know? Fill in the blank here, how am I gonna fit it in? Or just, you know, not using it again. As much as possible, I don't just do workshops, I'm usually working with people for an extended period of time, and I notice either that they're just not using it, or they're not using it in all the little ways. I'm coaching someone, they're doing the big project with me, but then they're not, when they get stuck on something, they're not thinking to come up with a lot of ideas instead of just one. They're not thinking to actually go talk to the people who are involved. It doesn't seem to scale. So to me, that's, it's not working. All these things to me were signs that could, things could be better. And then there's my kids, right? These guys, we, we met them before. I'm finding, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning, one of them is screaming, and I'm not, you know, being very empathic right now either. I'm not being very experimental or open-minded about what she's saying to me. You know, I'm not coming up with more than one idea besides yelling back at her about what to do, right? And so, you know, I started really noticing this and thinking to myself, well, no wonder everybody else is having a hard time with it. If I can't do it after 20 years, you know, I can't expect anybody else to do this stuff. It's, I'm being a complete hypocrite by asking other people to do this work. So, um, and also, you know, I think to me that was a big source of mission for me because I want to be the best I can with them all the time and I want to inspire them to be design thinkers and we all know that, you know, modeling is the best way to do that, right? Um, you may have kids or not, you all have parents. In my experience, even if you think you have the most amazing, creative, innovative, open-minded, empathic mindsets, one of those two groups has challenged that for you. You are not at your best with those people. That's been my experience. Can people relate to this a little bit? Okay. And now that I have kids, I realize both of those groups are really important, your parents do. Um, okay, so great processes and mindsets for finding new possibilities can be a little hard to access sometimes, right? There's that sentence again. We need practices, like concrete things, that are natural to us to use no matter what we're doing or how we're feeling. I think you know this gentleman, Aristotle, um, wonderful Greek, who said, we are what we repeatedly do, which sometimes gets quoted as, we are what we practice, right? Mindsets are great, but actions are, are louder than words or intentions, right? And processes are big, um, but practices are right in between. And it's the reason that we have things like this for how to help, you know, in an emergency, A through I, airway, breathing, circulation, like concrete practices that we can rely on. Um, because here's another one, another mnemonic, emotional reaction impedes control. I love that. <laughs> So that's exactly the reason we have things like this. It's not that you're not a great nurse, but we all forget things sometimes, right? And so, um, I, so through you know, all of this experimentation, I learned that, you know, what does this really mean? Like I learned a little bit more about powerful and simple. It means being really flexible, and that it works for different people who have different approaches. It works in really different situations. It works for really big things and really small things, and yet it's really concrete, right? We don't think of concrete as flexible, but it also has to be really clear and people immediately get it, what I'm, what I'm talking about, what I'm telling them to do, like clear instructions, which are also really flexible. And it needs to be founded in all of these great processes, but it also has to be really intuitive to people. So getting to that concreteness, luckily, a lot of these processes and mindsets actually explore a common sort of workspace, which I'm about to show you, that can be a concrete tool that um, connects us to our, our inner innovator. So some of my ideas in this space, you know, as I was developing all those worksheets and, and, and slides, I was trying to always show, don't look at these too carefully, um, <laughs> these are earlier versions, I was always trying to show what we were doing, not just all the slides, but one picture that would kind of show the design thinking process. And, and why? What are we trying to do? What is, what is the meaning of this? How does it look in one picture? And I would show that at the beginning and then once in a while in between and at the end. 
But then, one day, the first time I had to coach a bunch of people at the same time who were, all had their own different challenges, so I couldn't, I couldn't be with them all at the same time, I decided, well, what if we just try this on a piece of paper? What if we use it kind of like a worksheet or a workspace? What would happen? Could people kind of get started on their own? Forget all the slides, gone. Forget all the other workshop sheets, gone. Just this. What would happen? And this is that very first time, and it kind of worked. Like, people started stretching, coming up with um, new ideas and so on. Uh, new ideas, new observations, new principles. And then I kept pushing on this idea. I ended up putting it up on our website, on a website that I, I, ran, I quickly made called innovatorscompass.org. And now people are downloading it and using it on their own without me being there. This is a gentleman who took it out um, into the snow of Tahoe to help him think about things. And every time this is moving a little bit further from me, like I have a little bit less opportunity to guide people to say, oh, that's not what that means, or oh, you're stuck there, let me help you. It has to stand on its own. And so let me tell you, these words are getting like pushed into my head over and over again as people get stuck, as things aren't working, really does have to be all these things. And so it evolved. And here's where it wound up. So the space that all of these processes, design thinking, adaptive leadership, agile development that people use in software, scientific method, all first, or at least in part, ask us to see what's going on right now, the past and present, in new ways, so we can see the future in new ways. From being able to see the details to being able to see the big picture of what's going on. Does this feel, does this space feel kind of intuitive at all? Do you feel that when you're having breakthroughs in your life, having new ideas, realizing things? Do you feel like you move around in this space? Sometimes, oh my gosh, I totally didn't see the problem this way. I did not realize that was what he meant. I did not see how she was feeling. I did not notice that broken circuit, you know, whatever it is. Um, or seeing totally different ways you hadn't thought of before about how things could be, how things could change, how you could make that change happen. Does that sound right? And sometimes you really need to get into the details. You're missing the details. Sometimes you need to get out, right? Get your head out of the weeds and, and see big picture. <clears throat> oh, and I didn't put it on there, but and being able to, a lot of times all those things are about people at the center. Um, most of our problems are people, <laughs> you know, centered. This, this planet would have no problems without us, right? So, um, so centering on people all the time. You don't need to get into these very detailed, but again, here are all those different methods and just mapping out the steps of all those methods. They all kind of remind us there are ways, processes that are out there to remind us to stretch in these ways. They're in different contexts. Some are in leadership, some are in technical challenges, you know, but in each of these different areas of challenge in our life and work, they remind us to stretch in these same ways. And so, looking at all that stuff, and just trying to embody, you know, what it, again, what it felt like to really, you know, when we're being the most innovative, I found the most powerful, th powerful thing I can offer is what is being explored in each space. So in this case, being able to see the past and present new ways down to the details is about exploring your observations, questioning your fundamental observations about what is happening right now. Um, and offering a, the, the fundamental question behind it. So what is happening and why? I mean, it's kind of obvious what's happening and why. But we don't ask it very often. We don't really ask it. We don't really look in new ways, right? I also borrowed these verbs. People really like verbs, I found. They need to know the steps. So I took, these are ones from something um, called appreciative inquiry that you would have seen on the previous slide. I really like theirs. But you can use any, any phase name works here. You can, you know, different things that you, you, uh, you observe or you discover or you immerse, whatever, for observations. This is what you're exploring. You are questioning, exploring your observations in this space. In this space, you are questioning your principles, right? What do I really think matters most and why to all the people who are involved? So observations about all the people involved, what's going on with everyone there and why, anyone who might be involved. Um, 
and then what matters most to them. So this is getting out of the, the weeds, really seeing the big picture of what matters to people all the time, really embracing all the people who could matter. And then dreaming ideas, the space of ideas, getting away from the past, right? We are now in the future. It's, it's great to be informed by what's happened in the past, but now can you break away and really see the future in new ways without being beholden to the details yet? You're not worried about the details yet. You don't have to worry. You're not responsible for them. Just dream big. What's the big picture of everything that could happen? What are all the ways it could happen? And then finally, designing experiments. Getting down to details now and fi figuring out what's a way to try. Like right now, cheap, fast, simple, safe way to start trying to get doing, which brings you back into the real world, right? Can you make an experiment that you can now actually observe and maybe figure out some principles about how to make it better and some ideas about how to make it better in your next experiment? Um, I mean, you don't have to do it in that cycle. This whole space, you can find new possibilities to any problem you're trying to solve by looking in any of these directions. Maybe I need a new idea right now. That I feel like I need a new idea. I just need to look right now and, and understand what's going on better. Right? It's just kind of a workspace. But most of these processes, and most of us, I think, find new possibilities in one of those places. So here's some of these different processes that are out there. They just kind of traverse it in different ways. So design thinking, as I described in the story about the plane, is about taking like a big, very thoughtful, like let's do some research, understand the design principles, come up with a lot of ideas, come up with a first experiment, and then start to iterate. Lean startups, you probably know something about those around here, I'm guessing, are much more about like, you got an idea, just, you know, just go and just test it in lots of small ways and just evolve it as you go along. Um, and most of us as human beings, I think, actually live more in these worlds. <laughs> so this is, you know, and quite honestly, a lot of IDEO designers did too. So when we started talking about design thinking like this, a lot of IDEO designers were like, really? This is how I actually work. I don't wait until phase three to start drawing. I mean, I start tinkering right now. I go in the shop as soon as I've seen the first plane. So, you know, a lot of times it looks like this, right? Observe, try something, observe, try something. Ooh, Eureka, go back, you know. But you only have conscious, you know, bigger thoughts once in a while. And then someone mentioned Steve Jobs earlier, who like just has ideas out of nowhere, right? And they're amazing. Well, I would argue, probably not. So he's actually someone who's constantly, subconsciously or consciously, very aware of his observations of the world right now. Very strong, constantly developing principles about what really matters. Ideas all the time, right? And, and trying things in little ways, even if they're just thought experiments. So when he has his Eureka, you know, that we first hear about, and his company first hears about, there is a lot happening behind the scenes, I think, even if it's subconscious. And I think that's true for a lot of us, right? You have this amazing idea that came out of nowhere, but you can start to realize what you noticed and what you thought about that got you there. Do people relate to one or more of these as a way that they kind of work? I'm going to do another thing. So as a human-centered designer, just a quick check of how people are sort of following me right now. I told, five is, I totally understand everything you're saying. This is making sense. Zero is, what are we talking about? Why am I here? Wow. <laughs> okay. Cool. Okay. Just, just checking. Okay. Let me know otherwise. Okay. So last, last bit of theory, and then we're getting back into the stories. All of these different processes, you know, there's whole books. There's literally a book, 101 Design Methods. I really like it. I teach with it. Those methods are all either visual, verbal, or physical ways to explore one of these spaces. I, you, can, you can cut them out of the book and arrange them. That's what they are. <laughs> And different processes sort of bring different pieces. So IDEO, as I showed you, we're really good visually, verbally, and physically at these three sort of quadrants, like really observing things, um, coming up with crazy ideas, trying them. Um, a little bit in the, in the upper left, but like systems thinking, for example, which I do a lot of work with too, brings us a lot of visual and even physical tools for understanding really complex problems that just trying to describe those problems you know, trying to understand the principles in words, you will never be able to solve these bigger system problems. And so for me, what's really compelling is to bring those all together. 
not, this is not, I'm not trying to create the next process, but rather create some way of, of bringing them together um, that, that uh, we can bring the best of all worlds. And so sort of this is the next prototype. This is actually an old one from last summer that I, I need to pick up again this summer, but just one powerful visual, verbal, and physical way to explore each of the spaces. And if you want to go deeper, then please, you know, explore any of these more detailed processes that are out there. But this is the kind of level that I'm trying to get to. Just really fundamental. If you just explore these four spaces, five, including the people that you want to think about, and you do them visually, verbally, and physically, and we can remind people to do that, like, hmm, that could be pretty cool. What would that do? So here it is, Innovator's Compass. It was actually named by a, an, an educator I work with who teaches high school children. Um, I liked it and stuff. Um, and speaking of children, you know, kids already do this, right? They know how to be visual, verbal, and physical, right? They use all their senses, they use all their parts of the body to do all of these things, right? Has anyone tried to walk one block with a two-year-old? It takes half an hour. I mean, they're looking at everything. They're smelling everything, they're tasting everything, they're asking why, right? I said, what's happening and why? They ask why a lot, right? They're always trying to figure out what matters, and they're not afraid to see things differently than we do, right? They can dream big, right? They don't know boundaries. They're still figuring those out, right? Big picture of how things could happen, and they experiment. They totally do, right? They, they're, they're experimenting to learn all the time in everything that they do, and they experiment, again, visually, verbally, physically, right? So a lot of this is just about practices, keeping the practices that we were um, born with. Um, you know, these processes try to bring us back to that, but they're kind of hard to access in the moment, like day to day. I'm not gonna carry all of design thinking with me. Um, and the mindsets that we develop throughout our lives, you know, around these things, we have really great ones, but again, they're kind of slippery. And so, to me, these practices, something concrete like, okay, I'm gonna explore my observations, my principles, my ideas, my experiments, those four things, okay, and the people who are involved. Those are a bridge. They're a bridge to get us back to those mindsets that we sometimes lose, right? They bring us back to there. They're a bridge to all of these processes that, uh, that are out there um, that help us you know, take the step in that direction and even a bridge between them, right? I was able to map them together. So practices as a bridge to all of these things. And that's kind of the space that I'm playing in. Space, the final thing here. Um, the biggest thing that people need to supply is space like a moment even, in what you're doing, in what you're talking about. Um, we don't usually, you know, in, in our normal conversations, in meetings, for example, how often when you're discussing a problem and you're working on a problem, do you really ask what's happening and why, like what really matters, what could happen, you know, try experiments. We're not really mindful, we don't really try these things. And so it's about making space, even if it's really brief, to do this in the course of a conversation or, or otherwise. And so one of the things that this helps us do, you know, a picture is sort of worth a thousand words, it helps to make the space that you can actually fill out, either on paper or even in your mind, you can kind of move around in this space. And that's kind of the experiment with it, or on a whiteboard or whatever. You're using the whiteboard anyway, let's use it in a way that pushes us a little bit more than just listing the problems, right? You're thinking about it anyway. Let's even use my, my mental model of what I'm thinking about in a more effective way that's stretching me in these ways that are so powerful. And you know, move around in that space as much as we want to. It's not, it looks kind of square, but it's supposed to be motion. Um, as a workspace, it actually now exists in something called Murally, which is a uh, digital collaboration platform that's being used by designers all around the world right now. And so they have things like business model canvas, some people might know, or empathy maps, and they now have this compass as well. So stories, just a bunch of quick ones. Professional use, it can be used at a bunch of different levels. One is spontaneous, like I've talked about, I'm about to go into a meeting with my boss, let me briefly think about, you know, what's happening right now in the situation, what he's thinking, what I'm thinking, and so on. Um, can be project-based, 
projects that go through, uh, you know, developing observations, principles, ideas, right, for whatever it is that we're working on, and it can be much more strategic. As an organization, as a bunch of people, what are our observations, constantly collecting them and sharing them? What are our principles? What is our portfolio of ideas and our portfolio of experiments that we're trying? And constantly being aware of the workspace of our organization. Um, my examples are gonna be more on the spontaneous to project-based level. This is a um, software company that makes education software. And um, I was working with them to do design thinking. They're working with kids to just, this isn't software yet, it just it looks kind of like software to sort of play with, with ideas. Um, and as they're, as they're co-designing with young people and they're, they're trying out their prototypes, they're capturing their thoughts into an older version of the compass. What are my observations about what this person is saying? It's very easy to jump to ideas right away, but having a space to just observe what this kid is doing and saying and feeling about what, is, what they're showing them first, and then being able to capture you know, principles that I'm taking away from this. Oh, you know, I, she says I need it to be purple. Well, I can't make it the right color for every kid, but I can at least understand it needs to be relatable or whatever it is. Um, a place to capture new ideas, a place to capture the next experiment that they want to try, and ideally to try it right away with that kid. But this is a very tangible one. Um, another one, this is an, uh, an entrepreneur, in that entrepreneur group with, with uh, the education entrepreneurs who um, I asked the group to work on one person's challenge, and the person who volunteered it was having a team challenge. And he's saying, you know, his observations, people are feeling burnt out, he can see their body language. Um, you know, they're not feeling validated. Uh, the conversations they're having, he's picking up on his just raw observations of what's happening with his team. I feel like I'm more directive than I need to be. And then, you know, what are our most powerful, most powerful principles? Teamwork, collaboration, being valued and empowered. A we sense. And quite frankly, if you even just get there and you just act from that space, you'll be in a much better place. Even if you don't consciously think about ideas and experiments, even if you're just thinking about your principles, all of a sudden the things that you do in the future will be way more powerful. But we did, you know, people in the group were offering um, ideas, uh, you know, asking, trading places with your employees or asking them about their dreams or whatever, coming up with rituals. And then he came up with really specific you know, I'm gonna hang out in the lunchroom more. I'm gonna ask them about their values. Very specific experiments he was gonna go home and do right away. And then observe what happens next. So that's an example. Um, one more, just, this is a, a, all of the leaders of a district, an educational district in the US, in New Jersey. And working with them, this is a project that they're working about how do we gain clarity and focus as a group of leaders, school leaders. Same kind of thing, but what was really interesting to me as I was working with them is that a challenge came up, and like an emergency sort of came up, um, and the head of the district said, well, I'm gonna offer the group these two choices, and I'm gonna let them choose which one. And this is in the middle of our workshop, and I said, hmm, interesting. Um, that doesn't seem like design thinking. <laughs> you know, in just a little bit more time than it takes to just give them two choices, can you do a quick, Compass, listen to their observations about the situation, come up with principles together, let them come up with some ideas, and then choose which one you're gonna try. Um, and it didn't take a whole lot longer, but it, it turned out that his group of leaders was able to see that problem a little bit differently and come up with a couple of other ideas than the black and white solutions that he had. This was about a teacher strike that was happening. Um, his options, I think both of them might have alienated the teachers a little bit. Um, but the group was able pretty quickly to come up with better solutions and feel much more empowered. It was much more human-centered. They were able to empathize with the teachers that were involved. And so it's not just about you know, big strategic questions like this, it's about everything, every moment. And then one last one, this is, I work a lot in education these days. Um, this is a teacher who, uh, the same one who was out in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> um, asking himself, like, how do I, uh, he was very, you know, life of a teacher is really hard, and so he's do, using these cards, which I'm gonna give you, he's using one of them that he printed off the internet to kind of explore um, what he's feeling, like all the stress he's feeling, and 
um, and had this idea about creating a to-be list instead of a to-do list, and then he made it in his workshop, in his, uh, in his um, notebook. And so that was his experiment, is to start having a to-do be list. Sorry, a to be list and not just a to-do list. So from a very more corporate level to an individual level, but how do we deal with our work? Um, a few more examples from the college level at Olin College that I talked about. This is my class, user-oriented collaborative design. So, uh, so this is the entire sophomore class has to take it. It's about how to design for people. Big, yeah, big class. Um, we use the compass in it. And the first thing that I do the first day is ask them how they're creative. And they say stuff. And I just put it on a whiteboard as they're talking. We'll do this together in the workshop. Um, and I'm sort of arranging it, you know, mysteriously in space. But it's not mysterious, right? It's actually in the space of the compass. And then I add the compass spaces to it. But I, I let them sort of build it from their own experience. Um, and then we map. That's a whole semester. So these are all the methods that are introduced the whole semester. We map them to this compass and we introduce it as we go along for doing concrete design work with people. But it's more than that. So if that's in the middle, like the user, the people group that they're trying to design for, they're using this compass with. But they're also using it to design their own design process, to reflect on their own design process, their observations of how well it's working, their principles about what matters most, like if you know, things aren't working well, ideas to change their design process, experiments in their design process. And the same thing for their team's experience. This is a prototype this year, was trying to help, help them like, consciously look at it at all these different levels. Your team experience is just as important. It did result in a little bit of sarcasm from the students. This is a, a Shrek reference, um, that we're using it for so many things. So this is, this is a joke. Um, that they wrote, compass is love, compass is life, because we use it so much. But it is helpful. So here it is being used for process. This is my co-professor who's soliciting from the students what's going on right now with the whole studio. Everybody's working on these projects. They're kind of getting stuck. They're all sharing their observations. They're coming up with principles together as a class about how to do better and sharing ideas about how to get unstuck with their process. With teaming, they use it as a way to get to know each other at the beginning. Where are you strongest? This person is really more of a, you know, an ideas and experimentation person. I like to make stuff. Um, you know, where you've got people who are maybe more like to talk to people and, 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 and analyze. Um, and they use it to sort of set up their initial team principles and ideas for how they're going to work together. But then when things go wrong, because things go wrong, they're using it spontaneously. So this is a team that used it. They were failing. I mean, it was going, it was going very poorly. They were having a very hard time working together, and they used a spontaneous compass to figure out what was going on. It was just they had te a team from different campuses that were coming together, having a really hard time coordinating, and figured out actually in the end for all of this, what ended up working, whoops, I hit the wrong thing, um, was to have a phone call at 10 PM every night to figure out who was working on what and what was going on. And it's amazing. I mean, I would have imagined it, but it really turned this team around, and they were able to get themselves together and, and, and perform much better. So. Both pre-planned and spontaneous. And then finally, I'm using it all the time. This is the compass that is up in the classroom to gather observations, um, ideas, experiments from the students about the class. And we were able to implement a bunch of those experiments during the same semester. So they can feel that they have design agency in their own class. And so being able to make some of those changes that they suggested, not all of them. Some of them are going to have to happen next year. Some of them I have to step back to the principles behind them, and we might have to come up with a different idea. But a lot of it we were able to try out the same semester and make it a better class. The second class I have, very similar. So that was user-oriented collaborative design, which we call UOCD at Olin. I started another one, which is an, a seminar, non-credit class, U-oriented collaborative design. So students get to work on whatever they want in their school life or their home life or whatever. Um, using this stuff. And so this is a sophomore who's asking herself, what, what should I do? Like, what classes should I take um, to sort of you know, get myself towards where I want to be? What, what classes should I take? How should I think about my time here at Olin? And with her is a senior who she had started her work on this compass, and the senior came in and, and started to give her advice and offer her some other observations and ideas. So, Students in this class were able to just kind of dig into 
this is how they wanted to run it. They just wanted to dig into their own issues. Because everybody can see each other's work because it's very visual, and they would spontaneously start helping each other. This is a student, the student with the imposter syndrome, <laughs> working her, working that out. And what I thought was the most interesting is she did all this really great work about it. But when she did her, actually did her experiments about um, this class where she feels most like an imposter, she did her experiments about speaking up and, and being brave enough to answer, ask questions. She actually found that the problem wasn't what she thought it was. Actually, I don't think I have imposter syndrome. I just didn't realize it. Um, and so, to me, I thought that was really really, really powerful um, was that she actually ended up, you know, by moving all the way through it, not just, you know, assuming that she had this, but when she was able to actually speak up, she realized that um, it was just sort of the way she thought about the context and that when she just broke the ice, she was able to, to speak up and keep doing that. And then a final example, this is um, a, a senior who is a TA for for younger students um, on circuits. And he was literally thinking about how do I help students debug their circuits with a compass? So, you know, what, paying attention to what's going on in my breadboard, diagnosing what's going on, hypotheses about what, you know, might happen, and some experimentation to test it. So, very technical. Okay, and then final example is just coming back to those kids. So, this is Maya again, and um, this isn't that long ago. Her younger sister, Dahlia, was supposed to come to her same school. She'd gotten old enough to join her in preschool, and I'm hearing Maya say again and again, I don't want Dahlia to come. I don't want her to come to my preschool. And so for the first time, you know, Maya has seen this compass thing around. We talk about, you know, all the time, the ideas and experiments and so on, but I thought, let's actually do this. Let's try doing this together. She's four. Um, she said, can I draw it? I said, okay, and so she, <laughs> she draws the, the basic compass. And this is very spontaneous, by the way, which is why it's on a chalkboard. I would have probably sat down otherwise. We started, and I'm, I'm writing for her. I don't expect you to read this, but she's noticing things like, um, you know, how she feels. She feels like she's going she's gonna to feel different than her other friends because she's the only, other, the only one who has a, a sibling here. And um, I'm feeling like I don't, you know, like the that Dahlia um, is going to be singled out as the youngest one, all these things. And the, and the most important principles she came up with were um, that Dahlia feels like, um, like she's being, uh, that she's not like she's being the youngest. She feels good being at Kesher, um, that I don't get teased and we don't get teased, stuff like that. And she starts drawing herself and her sister, and she starts drawing them happy together, and that's her vision of the future. Um, we continued on to a piece of paper on the other side, she came up with a bunch of ideas, and the experiment she wanted to try was actually sharing. So these ideas were ways that the teachers could help or they could help themselves get around this problem, like telling kids that, or teasing them, hey, don't tease us, or whatever. And her experiment was to actually give this to the teachers and talk to them about it. And so that was easy. We did that. We brought it to the, the school. Um, and that was very tangible. And we talked about it. Um, and it turned out that actually a bunch of those things those things didn't really happen. They didn't get teased and so on, but I was able to ask her the next week, so what are your observations? What happened? And she said, you know, it, the problems didn't end up being those things. But, um, but it was really cool because she was then, you know, by doing this, she was really open to her sister coming. So to me, this is all really compelling because if something, you know, we talk about extreme users in design thinking, and so to me, something, that can work in a family living room, a kindergarten classroom, you know, a Fortune 100 boardroom, or a scientific clean room, and can be the same thing all the way across, and is actually really effective and powerful in all of them, is really hard to accomplish, and like amazing if it could work, right? So then pushing to see if it will actually do those things, and, and using it all the time, back to two o'clock in the morning. This is something I wrote after a two o'clock in the morning experience, but you know, in my mind, I had tried to stop, and I was noticing we're yelling, we're both hungry, it's just getting worse, you know, this could be a bonding moment, like, as a principal, I just want this to be a bonding moment, whatever happens, that's the most important thing right now, actually. Um, and so, you know, the experiment was like, let's try a glass of milk, you know, but like, just noticing that, and, and it got much better. Um, so, and, and a hug and apology as well, but just using it even in the moment, and I wrote it down afterwards because it had worked, and I was so excited. So, um, oh, and finally, this talk, this is the compass that started this talk. So, some observations of what I learned about you guys from, from Panos 
and me and, and principles. I'm not sure if I really embodied it. It's strong yet simple. I'm feeling kind of long here, but there it is. And one of my experiments is to create a post-it presentation, so there it is. These are all those slides in sticky notes. So that's it. Observations are big goals, mean navigating lots of different little things every day. The processes and mindsets are kind of slippery. Practices can help connect us to those. Luckily, those, those process and mindsets share a workspace that we can use as a tool that connects us to our own inner innovator because we all have it. There that is, the innovator's compass. Going to finish with another set of associations. We talked about what's an innovator. What's a compass to you? What are just words you associate with a compass? Direction. direction. Does it tell you the direction to go? What do you mean by direction? Right. It tells you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't give you a goal, right? You got to have the goal, right? But it helps you not feel lost. Anything else? Orientation. orientation. Yeah, powerful orientation, right? Into really meaningful directions. Like north, magnetic, you know, magnetic north. Like this is a meaningful direction that has a powerful yeah, association. Anything else? Reference. Compass. A reference point. A reference point. Compass, map, you can use it with a map. It'll orient, like a compass works anywhere, right? Nevada, Cyprus, Paris, whether it's urban landscape or, or very rough, right? Any landscape, any terrain, just like all those different kinds of challenges, right? Are you gonna say something? No, okay, I thought I heard another comment. Um, it orients different maps to each other, right? Just like those different processes. It can help orient all these different processes to each other. It also helps you make maps. If you are exploring, you know, uncharted territory, like I would venture a lot of these problems are, right? We all have our own problems, they're all different. Someone can tell you what to do, right? They can give you this process to solve it. Chances are it's not gonna feel like a perfect match, right? So the, the spirit of the compass is not that you have to follow it in a certain way, but that you're sort of, you know, exploring it your own way and charting your own territory and making your own maps. You can also use it without a map and you know, just help you navigate your own way to challenges that you see. Like a compass, you can take it out when you need to and when you feel like you've got your orientation, you put it away, right? You don't like walk around following your compass. And that goes for this too. Unlike some processes that you feel like you have to follow step by step, it's like when you're your center, right? Your human center, you're, you feel like Something's not quite right. I'm not on center. I'm not feeling like I probably am not being really creative with my ideas or following powerful principles. That's when you pull it out, right? When you need some orientation, when you're feeling a little bit lost, when you could use a sense of direction. It is not meant to be something you follow all the time. And that's very much how innovation is, right? Like, we mostly have to follow our gut. And sometimes our gut needs a little help. So the question is, well, what would happen if, you know, folks used something like that, just like we have, you know, ways to solve math problems and other kinds of problems. What, is, what would happen if people actually played with exploring, challenging their observations, principles, ideas, and experiments, and all the different things that they do? Here's some of the attributes that the compass sort of helps to develop in each, each, each space. And also overall, I would say creativity is needed throughout, that uh, they all sort of going through all of this over and over again develops resilience and a sense of gratitude for things. Um, but what would happen, you know? Can we try to develop and, and maintain these things? And if so, then one last quote. We all know this one, but um, you know, what would happen if we were just a little bit more of those things all the time? So next for me is just more of the same. You may have noticed that my journey followed the same thing, observations, developing principles, pushing the ideas, doing experiments, more of that. I'm basically a social entrepreneur trying to figure this out, working with, supporting a lot of people who are experimenting in the world with this um, and being supported by a lot of really great people. And I hope that you might, some of you guys might be some of those people. I'd say start. So I'm gonna put these, oh, people left, shoot without them. I didn't realize that these weren't out there. But um, here's some cards that have the compass on them. This is an experiment too. This is, you know, made these for 50 bucks myself. 
Um, but they're self-contained, and, and you can play with it any way you want to in anything. Right? Start now, start small. It could literally be on what you're going to have for dinner. It doesn't matter. Anything that you wrote. Um, these are the two things that we were required to have when I did winter training, like for being out in the mountains in the winter. A compass. So there's the compass. And the other one is a whistle, because it's, you're not alone. And so bring people into your work. Right? Ask for help. Do do. Um, so also think about this as a collaborative tool. It's not just something you use yourself. That's it. Thank you. I think I went way over, but... No